is from the book of the Acts of the Apostles, from chapter 17, beginning at verse 1, reading through verse 9. Acts 17, 1 through 9. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And then Paul, as his custom was, went into them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus, whom I preach to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women joined Paul and Silas. But the Jews who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace, and gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. And Jason's, Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar saying, there is another king, Jesus. And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. So when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. He who has ears to hear the Word of God, let them hear it. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, as we listen to the testimony of your saints from other parts of this world, this morning from Romania, We are moved at the graciousness that we have received from your hand in our freedom from persecution. And we pray that you would give to us steel for our souls, that if that moment comes here and to us, we will stand fast for you. For we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. The theme of this conference is turning the world upside down, and that theme has been taken from the text that I just read from the 17th chapter of the book of Acts. And there is one sense in which the title of the conference can be a little bit misleading. Because when I think of turning the world upside down, I'm really thinking in terms of turning the world right side up. Because we all know that according to Scripture, we live in a topsy-turvy world, a world where it has been said that 
Beggars ride on horseback while princes walk in rags. We live in a world where all around us the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer. We live in a culture where everything is exalted save the Lord God omnipotent. We're living in a world that is ruled by the prince of darkness. And we think that it is our task to turn the world right side up, and indeed, in some respects, it is. But when we hear this text in Acts, we have to remember that the statement to turn the world upside down is not given by a Christian. This is a charge or an accusation brought against Paul and Silas by those who are hostile to the ministry that they have brought to Thessalonica. And if we look at the words that are used here, we see that technically the uh, word that is used, turned upside down, means to upset to unsettle, to disturb, or to stir up. And any one of these definitions would certainly work to describe what had taken place when Paul and Silas brought the gospel to Europe on their second missionary journey. Because indeed, wherever they went, People were upset. People were unsettled. People were disturbed. And people were stirred up. But if we look at this text with the philosophy of a second glance, and we'll learn from the New Testament scholars that the phrase to turn the world upside down had not only this literal meaning that I've just given to you, but it was an idiomatic expression among the Jews. It was a way to describe an act of sedition, an act of treason. The very thing we've just heard from Joseph in Romania, that he was charged with sedition. He was charged with treason. Remember that the Lord Jesus Christ was executed for these same charges. He was executed under Pontius Pilate because the charge that was brought against him was that he was a usurper of the crown. He was a pretender against imperial Rome because he claimed to be a king. And over the cross in which he was crucified, Pilate had written, Jesus, the King of the Jews. There is no way we can understand the New Testament or the Old without taking seriously the central theme, the central motif, that draws together both Testaments, the Old and the New. And that central theme of the whole Bible is the theme of the kingdom of God. When Christ came preaching, he echoed the same announcement that had been made by John the Baptist, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. If I were to ask you today, what is the gospel, the first thing you would tell me is the gospel has to do with the person and the work of Jesus. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ because that's the way Paul and the apostles defined the gospel. But the first announcement of the gospel that came from John the Baptist and then from the lips of Jesus was that Jesus came to preach the gospel of the kingdom. Read the parables time after time. 
Jesus says, the kingdom of God is like unto this. And center to his proclamation was the announcement, the kingdom of God has come in your midst. And yet, the kingdom that the people were looking for didn't come. The people who were screaming their hosannas on Palm Sunday were profoundly disappointed when Jesus didn't in, usher in a visible kingdom to satisfy their demands. And so they crucified him. Now suppose that you had been a disciple of Jesus, and you had had the opportunity to spend three years at his feet, to listen intently, to memorize the teachings that he gave day after day after day. Imagine that you had Jesus who was the guest at a theological gab fest where you could come with all of your theological questions to get the final definitive answer from his lips. Or think of it another way with your imagination. Suppose that Jesus were a guest this morning, and he came here, or we had him seated out there in the bookstore at a chair, and you had an opportunity to go up to him and ask him one question. What would your question be? What would you ask Jesus? Well, we know that when the disciples came to the point of separation from Jesus, when he was about to depart from them, and he was ready now to be lifted up into his ascension on clouds of glory, they had an opportunity for one last question. What was the question? Lord, will you now restore the kingdom to Israel. We were hoping that when you sent out the 70, that would do it. And then when you went down to Jerusalem and came riding into the town with palm branches and hosannas in the air, we thought maybe then you would do it. And then when you came out of the tomb in resurrection power, we were looking for it then. Now, we've been pretty patient. Are you going to do it now? And what did Jesus say? How many times do I have to tell you, students, that I'm not going to restore the kingdom to Israel? How many times do I have to tell you that I'm not about a kingdom? How many times do I have to tell you that my kingdom is a spiritual kingdom that is hidden in your hearts or in your souls somewhere, put that in the jelly of evangelicalism. I'm never going to forget that line, Doug Wilson. <laughs> That's not what he said. What did he say? He said, you shall be my witnesses. You shall be my witnesses. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the other most parts of the earth. And on that day and at that time, the church of Jesus Christ was given its final instructions, its final marching orders as the Lord of glory ascended to the right hand of God. And what he was saying is, I'm going up there to assume the position of cosmic king to be established on the right hand of God, to be the king of the kings and to be the Lord of the lords. I'm going to my coronation. I'm going to my investiture as the cosmic king Whereas Doug mentioned, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me, but my kingdom, which is real, is not visible to people here, and your job is to make it visible. Your job is to bear witness to my kingship. And you know, those of you who are pastors, 
and who are students of Greek, you know what the Greek word that is translated here for witness is. What is it? Martoria. What English word do we get from that word martoria? Martyr. The martyrs were not witnesses because they were martyrs. They were martyrs because they were witnesses. They were martyrs because they fulfilled the mandate of their Lord to make His invisible kingship visible. Now, with all this talk of the kingdom of God that we find from the lips of Jesus and in the New Testament, it's no wonder, is it, that people saw the rise of Christianity as a political movement. Because in a real sense, it is political. Because we're talking about who is in charge of the whole universe. The ultimate political candidate is Jesus Himself. And that's a threat to all earthly rulers and all earthly powers who don't want to be accountable to the King of Kings. And we saw it in the martyrdom of the early Christians as they were brought into confrontation with imperial Rome. At the time the church was being established, in addition to the popular deities of the Roman pantheon, there was also the cult of emperor worship, where the emperors claimed to be deities. And part of the loyalty that a Roman citizen had to declare and proclaim to the empire was to proclaim his loyalty by a loyalty oath to the emperor himself. And all that was required from the Roman citizen to declare their public loyalty was to declare these words, two words, Kaiser Curios. Kaiser Curios. Caesar is Lord. And when the Christians were brought before the magistrates and they were required to give this oath of loyalty, they would say, the authorities would say to them, say now, Kaiser Curios, and the standard response of the Christian in that circumstance was to reply by saying, Jesus Ho Curios. Jesus is Lord. Hey, We'll pray for Caesar. We'll pay taxes to Caesar. We'll render to Caesar the things that are Caesar. But lordship has not been given to him. We confess the lordship of Christ. Beloved, the very first confession of faith, the first creed of Christianity was the simple creed Jesus is Lord, and for that they died. I've often wondered because this Bible says no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And I've been puzzled with that text many times because there are the other occasions where Jesus, for example, says, this people honors me with their lips but their hearts are far from me. And Jesus says, on the last day, many would come to him and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this in your name and didn't we do that in your name? And he's going to say to them, please leave. I don't know who you are. And so in that respect, Jesus makes it abundantly clear that people have a facile ability to say that Jesus is Lord without meaning it. So maybe when the New Testament says, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit, 
that the statement is elliptical and it tacitly assumes something that is not included explicitly in the text, namely what is understood as the phrase, and mean it, so that the full statement would be, no one can say Jesus and Lord and mean it except by the Holy Ghost. Maybe that's all that it means. But it might also call attention to that time in church history where you didn't even want to say it out loud without the backing of God the Holy Spirit, because to say it out loud was to risk your very life. A couple of Sundays ago in our church, I told our people the story of Polycarp, the Bishop of Smyrna, who had been a personal friend in Ephesus of the Apostle John. And so there was a direct line from Jesus to John to Polycarp. And when Polycarp was in his late 80s, he was arrested and brought into the arena and commanded to recant of his faith in Christ. Now, the authorities had a little bit of a sticky wicket dealing with, what are you people looking at over my shoulder? Okay, you're looking at me. That's good. <laughs> I don't know which was better, Doug, to have the situation like we had last night where we couldn't see the people in the congregation, or now watching them all not looking at me. <laughs> I mean, the first thing they teach you in seminary is you're supposed to establish eye contact, but I need a stepladder to do that with you people. <laughs> okay. The authorities have a sticky wicket because they don't want to throw Polycarp to the lions or to the gladiators. 86-year-old man, what sport is that? in killing somebody of his venerability. So they were trying to let him off the hook, tried to get him to give the loyalty oath. All you have to do, Polycarp, is say, guys are curios. He says, I can't do it. Just mildly deny Jesus. Well, I said, how can I do that? For 80 and 6 years, he has been faithful to me. How can I now betray him? And they said, well, look, just repudiate the false religion, because Christians were accused of atheism because they didn't believe in the gods of the Romans. And so now the interrogator says, when he's on the floor of the arena, Polycarp, Bishop of Smyrna, all you need to say to save your life is away with the atheists. So Polycarp smiled and he said, well, I can do that. And he pointed to the emperor <laughs> and to the Roman authorities, and he said, away with the atheists. and it cost him his life. I have a uh, paper clip in my Bible here. Between Acts 17 and the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26. Let's move backward in time just a short distance from the missionary expedition of Paul and Silas, Timothy. And let's go back to the Garden of Gethsemane, where in chapter 26 of Matthew we read this. Verse 35. Peter said to Jesus, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. Did you hear that? 
At the Last Supper, Jesus says, Peter says to Jesus, Jesus, if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. The next verse. And so said all the disciples. Not just Peter, but all the rest of them jumped in and said, me too. Where he leads me, I will follow. I can hear my Savior calling. Saying, Christian, follow me. I'll follow you, O Lord. I'll take up your cross, and I'll follow you wherever it takes me and whatever it costs me. Have you said that to Christ? I have. Peter says, if I have to die with you, I'll not deny you. And all the rest said, me too. So Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. I'm not asking you to be exposed in the darkness of the garden to the troops that may appear and stand there beside me. You stay here while I go over there and pray. And what I'm asking you to do is watch with me. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. And he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. And he went a little farther, and he fell on his face, and he prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And then he came to the disciples. And he found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? You'll go with me to die? You just said. I didn't ask you to die with me, Peter. I simply asked you to watch with me for one hour. There's an interesting irony that is found in this text because Jesus here and elsewhere speaks throughout his ministry about his coming hour. And his strange allusions to that image of his hour that it was to come have befuddled New Testament commentators and theologians for centuries because it's apparent that when Jesus spoke about his hour, he didn't always speak about the same thing. There were some times that he referred to his hour that referred to his hour of vindication, his hour of triumph, his hour of resurrection, his hour of manifesting his glory. You remember when Mary came to him at the wedding feast of Canaan after the, after Cana, after the, uh, uh, the host was embarrassed because he ran out of wine. It wasn't a Baptist marriage ceremony. Was it, Al? <laughs> so, so they ran out of wine, and Mary is feeling sorry for the host and comes up to Jesus and tugs him on the arm and says, Son, do something. It's time for you to do your stuff. You know, I've been praying for you and nurturing you and standing on the sidelines all these years. I remember the prophecies of Simeon and of Anna and all of that stuff. I'm ready now. Go ahead, Jesus. Do your thing. She said, what am I to you, woman? Don't you know my hour has not yet come? 
He spoke to the Father and said, My hour is come and now is that you would glorify me. But the other dimension in which Jesus speaks of the hour is in the hour of his humiliation, the hour of his death, the hour of his grand passion. And it is now that hour that has come upon him that he is speaking of in this text. And while that hour is staring him in the face, the literal hour of 60 minutes is more than Peter can endure watching with him. What? Jesus says, finds him asleep, wakes him up. What? Can't you watch with me for one hour? Can you imagine the embarrassment of Peter who had just been so bold to say that he would die with Jesus? Now he can't even stay awake for it. He jumps up and he says, oh, Lord, I'm sorry. He said, I didn't realize how sleepy I was. Fell asleep. Uh, it won't happen again. Trust me. Or words to that effect. Watch and pray, Jesus said, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again a second time he went away and prayed, and he say, Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and he found them, listen to this, he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. And he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Stand up. Let us be going, for see, my betrayer is at hand. And then we read the passage that records for us the betrayal of Judas with the kiss of death, the arrest of Jesus, and then almost as a concluding unscientific footnote, the end of verse 56 gives us this grim conclusion. Listen, folks. Then all of the disciples forsook him and fled. Me too. I will go with you to death. Then all of his disciples forsook him, and they fled. Now, what happened between Gethsemane and Thessalonica. What happened that turned these fleeing cowards into martyrs? The record of history indicates that 11 of the 12 disciples were martyred for their faith in Jesus Christ, and the only one who wasn't was John, who spent his final years in exile and isolation. Every one of these men endured ultimate persecution after first falling asleep and then fleeing from a handful of soldiers. What changed them? Or what produced 
an apostle Paul, who wrote from the maritime prison, that cistern cut out of the rock across the street from the Roman Forum, as he was awaiting his execution, he writes his final letter to Timothy. And at the end of the letter, after he states to Timothy, I am ready to be poured out as an oblation unto Christ. He said, but Timothy, Demas has left me. Demas has forsaken me because he loved the world. And then he talks about those who were with him in his first imprisonment and said all of them had forsaken him. And Paul said, but Jesus has not left me. The experience of forsakenness by comrades, by friends, by co-laborers such as Demas was typical in the early church. There were those in the sands of the Circus Maximus who stood before the public and repudiated Jesus Christ. There were those who trembled before the gaping jaws of the lions and said, I recant. Some forsook him, but others did not. And I'm concerned in the few moments I have left to talk about those who did not forsake him. And I ask why. What turned Peter, James, and John from cowards into heroes? I think obviously the first thing that marked their transformation was the resurrection of Christ. They were eyewitnesses to the risen Savior. And they saw the truth of Christ. And they saw the significance of the truth of Christ. And they saw the importance of the truth of Christ. In other words, if you would have asked them, are you a Christian? They wouldn't have answered that question by saying, well, sure, I'm an American, or sure, I'm civilized. They would say, are you a Christian? And they would say, yes. And they would understand what that meant. They would understand the truth of Christ, the truth of the gospel, the truth of the cross, and then they would understand the significance of that truth that it was not just some uh, abstract theoretical proposition, but it touched the deepest core of human reality and addressed the deepest problem of human existence. They saw the truth of the cross, they saw the significance of the cross, and they saw the importance of the cross, and so they would never compromise the cross. They believed the truth. They really believed it. And beloved, anybody who believes the gospel of Jesus Christ, if they understand it at all, would rather die than to compromise it. How could you understand the gospel? How could you love the gospel and go to sleep? There was no compromise in these people. Luther made the observation 
where the gospel of Christ is preached accurately and boldly, there will always be conflict. We don't need to add any offense to the cross. There's already enough there. But our problem is that we try, as Doug has pointed out, to discount the offense of the cross, the offense of the gospel, and that's easy to do. Just don't preach it accurately or don't preach it boldly. Preach a gospel like this, God loves you unconditionally. That's the gospel of the modern evangelical who gets on television and pronounces that to the world. What does the pagan hear when he hears a preacher stand there and say, God loves you unconditionally? What's he hear? He hears this. God loves me. He's so gracious. There's such a wideness in his mercy. I don't have to do nothing to please him. I don't have to repent. I don't have to flee to the cross. I don't have to embrace the blood of Christ. Those are conditions. Those are strings. God loves me unconditionally. Nobody's ever been killed for announcing to the world that God loves them unconditionally. But the reality is he doesn't. These men believed the gospel. Secondly, from their perspective, they had absolutely nothing to lose. The Apostle Paul used a crudity in the Bible that no English translator up till this day has been bold enough to translate accurately in the vernacular. Instead, they have taken the word of the apostle and the inspiration of God the Holy Spirit and translated it with an English euphemism. And the euphemism that is chosen as the choice of most translators is the word dung. It's not the word the apostle used in the text. But forget that. What he was saying, however nice word you want to use, he said, whatever things I've gained in this world, I count as dung next to Christ, the pearl of great price. What did they have to lose? They had nothing to lose. Once they understood the gospel, the worst, darkest hour I believe of the Christian church was in the fourth century early on the Edict of Constantine, with the wave of his scepter, he declared the entire Roman Empire Christian. And for the first time in her history, the church had something to lose. The church had respectability. The church had acceptance. The church had wealth. The church had political correctness to lose. Thomas Aquinas visited Rome, saw the opulence of the city, was meeting with the Pope, and the Pope was showing him this chapel and that chapel and this uh, decoration and that decoration, and the Pope smiled and said to Thomas, you know, Thomas, no longer can the church say, as Peter said, silver and gold have we none. And Thomas looked at the Pope and he said, I see. Maybe that's why we can no longer say, pick up your bed and walk. What Thomas was getting at is, we have something to lose. And that's what Joseph was talking about with respect to to the American version of Christianity. The people in Europe, the people in Africa, the people in Indonesia don't understand us. They don't understand why we're so ready to compromise the gospel. What they don't understand is that we have so much to lose. 
And that which we're afraid to lose, they gave up a long time ago. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, what happened between Gethsemane and Acts 17 was the day of Pentecost. But when they went out to the Mount of Ascension and they saw Jesus being lifted up in the clouds of glory, they stood there and they stared and they stared and they stared, savoring every possible second of visually seeing the glory of Christ as He was departing from them until the angel stood there and said, Men of Galilee, Why do you stand gazing into heaven? This same Jesus who has departed from you will return in like manner. Again, the instructions that were given to the first disciples is wait, tarry in Jerusalem, for you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and then shall you be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth, when after you receive power. I don't believe in neo-Pentecostal theology, but if there's any group of evangelicals in the 20th century who are turning the world upside down, it's the Charismatics. And I'll tell you why. The charismatic Christians believe in the power of the Holy Ghost. I think there's some serious errors in their theology when they think that only some believers have the power of the Holy Ghost. I think the Apostle makes it clear in the New Testament that every single person who was born of the Holy Spirit is also empowered by the Holy Ghost for ministry. So that each one of us who is in Christ today has the same power in us and for us and our dis at our disposal that was given to these people who were deserters who became martyrs. And so the final reason for this transformation was their empowerment from on high. That Christ gave them the command and He gave them the command and the power to fulfill the command. And He has given the same thing to His church today. And so if we believe like they believed, if we will count everything as dung, save the kingdom of Christ, and if we will act according to our rebirth right of the empowering of the Holy Spirit, people will say of us that we are turning the world upside down. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we believe. Help thou our unbelief. Father, our spirits are willing but our flesh is weak. Give us, O oh Christ, the courage never to forsake You as we enjoy the certainty that You will never, ever forsake us.